With this aim in mind, Britain had become the only European power to establish a major foothold in the Middle East, in the principalities around the Persian Gulf, in Aden, and in Egypt. Britain had annexed Egypt from Turkey's Ottoman Empire in 1882, and by the time it was made a protectorate in 1914, Cairo had become the center of British power in the Middle East. The presence of imperial troops in the region was of vital strategic importance, for the Ottoman Empire under Sultan Mohammed V was in alliance with Britain's much feared rival, Germany. Together with the Austro-Hungarian Empire, these countries made up the Central Powers, and pitted against them were the three allies, Britain, France and Russia. From the Ottoman capital, Constantinople in Turkey, the Sultan ruled over the last of the great Islamic empires. It had been an almost terminal decline for decades, yet the fate of the Ottoman Empire was to be sealed by the outbreak of the First World War in August 1914. In Europe, Germany's rapid advance was halted by Britain and France along the Western Front. In the east, Russia's war against Germany and Austria-Hungary also reached deadlock. The powerful weapons of the Industrial Age were killing thousands of men in the trenches of every army. All of the leading powers expected the war to be over within a matter of months. So in that sense, all of them are surprised at the end of 1914, when not merely is the war going on, but it shows every sign of being likely to go on for a very long time. At that point, they begin to think about new ways of winning the war. Britain's Prime Minister Asquith felt that with the stalemate in Europe, it was essential to widen the conflict. Together with Foreign Secretary Lord Grey, Minister for War Lord Kitchener, and the First Lord of the Admiralty, Winston Churchill, they masterminded a complex strategy to undermine the Central Powers. This was a global war, and the British saw the Middle East very much in a global context. The traditional British preference for sideshows, as people um, unfavorably call it, the, the indirect strategy, the way of uh, attacking the soft underbelly, as Churchill called it, uh, of the enemy. And the soft underbelly was seen to be Turkey. Britain's secret plan involved on the one hand a military diversion and on the other a devious use of diplomacy through bribery, subversion and double dealing. All these devices focused on the enemy's weakest link, Turkey's Ottoman Empire. Diplomacy in general has always had a secret dimension to it, whether, where, but where discretion ends and conspiracy begins is an open question. But during the period bef up to and during the First World War, there was a particularly intense set of negotiations and discussions between the major imperial powers, between the French, the Russians and the British in particular, cutting in the Italians as well, about what would they do when the war was over and when the Ottoman Empire broke up. The British government hoped that by striking a deal over the spoils of war, it would strengthen the alliance against the Central Powers. Italy's King Vittorio Emmanuel was another target for bribery. Britain, France and Russia tried to tempt Italy, a pro-German state, to join the Allies. In April 1915, a secret treaty offered Italy a substantial bit of Ottoman real estate in Anatolia. It's another power coming into the equation and being offered territorial advancement which in normal circumstances would have been quite inconceivable. The bribe worked. Italy joined the Allies and declared war on the Central Powers in August 1915. Amongst the Allies, Russia had long sought access to the Mediterranean. In a secret treaty of March 1915, Britain and France offered what was to the Tsar a prize of vital geopolitical importance. Constantinople. 
It is that key outlet into the wider world and into the Mediterranean. And it is the one thing, of course, the British and the French have been attempting to prevent the Russians from achieving. So this is a complete volte face. This is, this is the British, the French and the Russians coming to an agreement over something which was, up to this point, almost inconceivable. In the early spring of 1915, the British began to mount the Dardanelles operation to relieve their Russian allies and to break the stalemate on the Western Front. Their object was to capture Constantinople and the Straits. But Constantinople and the Straits constituted a prize coveted for more than a century by their new allies, the Russians. As the Dardanelles campaign opened, the Russians made it clear to the Western Allies that when the war was over, these waters and the great city which stood on them were to be Russian. The Tsar sought from his allies what, as former enemies, they had long denied him. So what card did he play? This one. On the Eastern Front, the Russians engaged large and powerful German armies. If these armies were to turn to the West, this would be a disaster for the French and British. There were very strong hints from the Russian leadership that a separate peace would be made if their demands were not met. Stretched on the rack of the Western Front, soon in difficulty in the Dardanelles, the British and French reluctantly gave in to the Russian demands. Round one of the diplomatic game to the Russians. A revolution in the balance of power which triggered off round two. This began as the British and French turned on each other in a diplomatic struggle for what remained of the Ottoman Empire. The French opened the game by asking for a great deal. For the whole of the Levant, beginning on the Mediterranean coast of Turkey itself and running down to what is now the Gaza Strip in southern Palestine. The French wanted all this coastline and a substantial part of the hinterland of that coast, including Palestine. This was not acceptable to the British. The British certainly didn't want the French sitting on the Egyptian border. Egypt was then British, threatening the canal, Britain's gateway to her Indian Empire. After a good deal of give and take, the agreement the French and British finally came to, which was signed in May 1916, produced a map which looked like this. The area which is now called Syria and the Lebanon was to be in the French sphere of influence. The area which is now Jordan, southern Palestine and a good deal more besides was to be in the British sphere of influence. Most of the area which was later Palestine was called in the agreement the Brown Area. The Brown Area was not to be under the control of any particular power. It was to be internationally administered for the ostensibly high-minded reason that the holy places were there. The brown area, roughly Palestine, would be run, among others, by the British, French and the Russians, who were a party to the Sykes-Picot Agreement, as it was called, after the names of the principal negotiators. Looked at in terms of British interests, the Sykes-Picot Agreement had succeeded in pushing back strong French claims very substantially. The French were no longer in a position to threaten Egypt. So round two to the British. But Britain's strategy to undermine the enemy via the Ottoman Empire also required subversion. By using domestic opposition to weaken, maybe even destroy it, Britain exploited a new movement sweeping through the empire, nationalism. Nationalism in the sense of believing that there are peoples with a clear cultural identity and that these people should have been independent. That idea spread to the Middle East as to other parts of the world in the latter part of the 19th century. So you had the beginnings in the Ottoman Empire of a Turkish nationalism. This came to a head when the young Turks took power in a coup in 1908 and started to impose their language and culture on the Arabs of the empire. But this only reawakened an interest amongst Arabs in their own heritage. 
A thousand years before, Arabs had brought the technology and literature of the East to the West, and their religion, Islam, had encompassed much of Asia, North Africa, and southwestern Europe. The idea of recovering that historic grandeur had remained in the consciousness of Arab intellectuals. By the start of the First World War, the antagonism between Arab and Turk had increased. The very fact that the Turks were saying, we want to have a unified empire, meant the Arabs said, wait a minute, we're not part of this. So all of this literary and nationalistic revival then took a much more political form, and therefore you got the emergence of Arab nationalism. They had arrived at the conclusion that remaining in the Ottoman Empire was becoming hopeless, that they couldn't actually share power with the Turks. And they began thinking of having their own state. By the summer of 1915, British intelligence confirmed that the Arab nationalist movement was the breakthrough the government was looking for. Britain and her French ally dispatched officers to sound out Arab leaders. Both the French and the British started, you could say, seducing various local Arab leaders that if you side with us, we'll give you your independence, so why don't you leave the Ottomans? And various people were tempted as a result. If they, they thought they could actually gain independence, why not side with the Europeans against the Ottomans? The idea was to tempt the Arabs into a revolt against their Ottoman overlords and create a diversion which would tie down the central powers in the Middle East. In 1916, instigated by the British, the Bedouin tribesmen of the Hejaz, in what is now Saudi Arabia, had risen against their Turkish masters, the Arab revolt. The story of the Arab revolt is now part of the mythology, as well as the history of the period. Its military function was modest. As far as the British were concerned, its main purpose was political to undermine the loyalty of the Arab provinces and of the numerous Arab soldiers who served the Turks. But the Arab revolt had another purpose. It enabled the British to persuade the French to modify and soften their original extensive demands. In crude terms, the British were able to argue that they were taking territory from the French to reward the Arabs rather than to advantage themselves. But were the Arabs who were encouraged by the British to rise themselves deceived and misled? This is the heart of what became known as the Arab question. Certainly the Arabs were exposed to some grandiose rhetoric about restoring a great Arab nation to hints about establishing an Arab caliphate to replace the Turks as leaders of the Muslim world. Many Arabs believe that the British also promised that Palestine would be part of an Arab state. But in their dealing with this man, the Sharif of Mecca, Hussein, leader of the revolt, the British were fulsome. But here again they were also deliberately vague and non-committal. McMahon, the principal British negotiator, was high-flown but evasive. The correspondence he engaged in with the Sharif peters out inconclusively. It contains nothing concrete. It can't be construed as a binding treaty. But whatever the letters actually did or did not promise, the tune they played was one which would later sound faithless to Arab ears. On November the 21st, 1919, François-Georges Picot, the co-architect of the Sykes-Picot Agreement, and the French General Gouraud arrived in Beirut. And so began the imposition of the French mandate for Syria and Lebanon. The British forces, who had occupied the region since ousting the Ottoman Turks during the last months of the war, were handing over power to the French, thus fulfilling their wartime pledge. Faisal, 
who had been the governor of Damascus now for 16 months, had been consolidating his position. When he was proclaimed king by the Syrian National Congress, the French were incensed, and General Gouro sent in his troops. By August the 7th, 1920, Faisal had been deposed and had to flee to Palestine. The promises to Sharif Hussein and Faisal of a single independent state were now a distant memory for the Europeans. The whole issue of spheres of influence meant that what appeared, what was at first appeared to be a willingness to accept a single Arab state was in fact seriously diluted. And then on top of that, of course, the very fact of there being a French area and a British area meant that in effect this was the seed of partition. So you had both independence was denied, but also the unity of this area was denied. The boundaries and governments of the Middle Eastern states that emerged bore the unmistakable imprint of the Sykes-Picot Agreement. The French half of the previously Ottoman province of Greater Syria became the mandate for Lebanon and Syria. The other half became the British mandate for Transjordan and Palestine. In the east, the Ottoman area of Mesopotamia, which included the oil fields of Mosul, was given to Britain as the mandate for Iraq. So this was basically the importance of the Sykes-Picot Agreement, to divide what is called the Fertile Crescent between Iraq and Syria and let Britain get access to the oil of the area and be able to exploit it in the future. I believe that. But for the Sykes-Picot Agreement, the Arab territories would have been one unified country with an integrated economy. What Syria lacks, we can find in the Arabian Peninsula. What the peninsula lacks, we can find in Iraq. What Iraq lacks can be found in Egypt or in the Maghreb or in Sudan. The Arab countries would have been economically integrated. And had it not been for these divisions, I believe the situation of the Arab states or of the Arab people as a whole in the Middle East would have been much better than it is now.